This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And we are joined this week by Margie Waller, senior fellow at Topos. And we talked about some of Topos' research a couple of weeks ago. This week we asked Margie to join us so she could maybe talk about this a little bit. We'll get a little presentation from her in a minute. First of all, Margie, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So for those in our audience who may not watch every single episode of Sound Notion, and you guys should really do that because you're missing out, um, could you tell us just a little bit about what Topos is, uh, what, what kinds of work you guys do, the kinds of research that you're involved in, and how that might relate to our audience who cares deeply about the arts uh, and, and the future of the arts? Sure. Uh, Topos is a national strategic communications research organization. And we work a lot with national foundations, national uh, advocacy organizations, and think tanks, and focus primarily on doing research called framing science research, which will help us identify ways to communicate about particular issues that build broad support for policy goals. Topos uh, did the kind of nation's first research, framing science research, about the arts. Uh, finding out what people think about the arts, kind of what their natural default way of thinking about the arts is. And as I'll tell you a little bit about uh, in the presentation I'm going to share, the, um, the way that that thinking has interfered with building broad support for the arts and allowing those who um, critique the arts in the public dialogue um, to be successful, basically. Um, and I should tell you that I... When Topos was doing that research, I was actually working for an organization called um, the Fine Arts Fund. Uh, now it's called Arts Wave in Cincinnati. Uh, it's a regional um, United um, Arts Funding organization. So they raise money every year, sort of the United Way style, and give it away to the arts. It's the nation's largest um, and oldest United Arts Fund, uh, raising about $11, $12 million every year and giving it away to about 150 regional arts organizations. And they are the ones who commissioned the research. Um, and I managed that project at Artsway before going to Topos. Great, Margie. Thanks for uh, giving us that introduction. Maybe now is a good time to share this presentation. We saw a little bit of it in the, the pre-show, and it looks really cool. We're really excited about it. Okay, well, um, one of the fun things about this presentation is that it uses um, a, a platform called Prezi. You guys have mm -hmm. familiar with Prezi? Um, and I really like Prezi um, for sharing this kind of research. Can you see it now? Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, because it lets, it lets me share a lot of images and, um, and video, which is really helpful in making the, the points about the research. So uh, just to start off, as I mentioned, um, the, the work was done um, with the Topos uh, and Artswave in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and that's that's just how you find us now if you want to find the website. Um, mm -hmm. And sorry, this this is me, and uh, that's Margie Art Girl with two R's or four R's really, but Girl with two R's. Um, and we started off um, asking ourselves, you know, why is it that we we have like you know great value propositions about why the arts are important? We've got lots of research that backs that up. And yet it seems like we're working so hard just to defend a little bit of public funding for the arts. Um, and so Artsway Topos came together to look at, you know, how do we get more people to support the arts? Because it feels like after years and years of making the case, um, you know, working hard to get news stories on the front page, um, people still don't think about the arts as residents. They tend to think about it as consumers. Uh, which is great, of course, when you're selling tickets, but not when you're trying to get people to say, yes, this is a matter of public concern. And just to give you a couple of examples of that, um, this is Boston newspaper um, when President Obama in his first term proposed, you might remember this, a little tiny bit of funding for the National Endowment for the Arts uh, as part of the stimulus bill. And you got headlines like this. Some doubt it would create jobs. And I can just tell you as a communicator that when you're having that debate, 
are arts jobs jobs or not, or are there enough jobs being funded through the arts to make it worthwhile? You've basically already lost the fight because you're the media is just going to cover the fight, and people stop paying attention to um, the facts. Frankly, they've already got an opinion about it. So this are also you know just kind of classic examples of the how we see the debate unfold um, in the press in the media, which is you might remember this when um, the Smithsonian. Uh, had an, an installation that became controversial, and you've got people as prominent as the Catholic League president sort of getting away with saying things like, why should the working class pay for the leisure of the elite, um, and then going on and comparing it to, you know, if we're going to support things like this, why wouldn't we support pre professional wrestling, because I like to go to that. Um, I thought you guys might appreciate I have tons of examples, and I just pulled a couple for this conversation. But this was um, comments from uh, the Detroit Symphony strike. And we covered it extensively. <laughs> no. Do you remember? I mean, there really wasn't a public funding issue there. And yet um, you get this kind of, you know, what would it be like if you had to get a real job? Culture is irrelevant today. Um, I oftentimes look at comments um, when you see this kind of uh, news story just to get a sense of the pulse of the community. And you find these kind of classics, these kind of comments are sort of classic. Um, people would rather listen to Lady Gaga than Beethoven. Take the pay cut if you want to keep playing Mozart, etc. Oh, okay, so this next uh, clip um, is from the presidential primaries, the Republican primaries. And I know that um, this, I put this into my presentation long before Romney made his comment about Big Bird during the debate, which you might remember. But um, I put it in here from when he said it during the primary because, primaries, because it's a great example of how the arts are used by people who support small government. Um, so let me show you the, pre the, the comment and then we'll talk about it for a second. He was asked, um, how would you deal with the, the deficit? So the, his answer is to start with this. My test is, is a program so critical that it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And, and the answer, I, so on that, I guess say some, so some things that you might like, you might say, I like the National Endowment for the Arts. I do. I like PBS. We subsidize PBS. Look, I'm, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to say PBS is going to have to have advertisement. We're not going to kill Big Bird, but Big Bird's going to have advertisements, all right? So, um, as I said, that's, that is a, you know, this happens a lot. People who support smaller government... Um, or want to make a point about wasteful government spending, oftentimes will point to the arts. And they do that for a reason, because, um, you know, the public tends to react like, yeah, of course. And, you know, when we have competing needs, the arts are not a high priority. And that is really our problem. We're vulnerable because of that. So we did this research. I just want to give you a little brief about the me methodology. Um, Framing science involves lots and lots and lots and lots of interviews, basically. We did media and public relations scan first because media tends to reflect back. Um, we did lengthy one-on-one -on -one interviews with a diverse set of residents in the region, meaning um, we were looking for not so much what they know about the issue, but how they think about it. And then we did focus groups that we worked with a firm to recruit people who were, again, diverse, regionally representative um, diverse in every way, including arts connected and non arts connected. Um, these people did not know the purpose of the research or who was sponsoring it. And then hundreds of talk back sessions, uh, which are really basically a way of one on one conversation, testing a concept or an organizing idea that might be a paragraph long, just to see whether it um, resonates with people, whether it makes sort of common sense to them and whether they can repeat it back to us, meaning that the idea sort of holds together. It's sort of like a big game of telephone. Um, <clears throat> then we did more focus groups and it, we, we discovered some things in the research that made us kind of unhappy. So we asked the researchers at Topos then to go back and do some additional research on a couple issues. Now this is framing science. Um, framing science is an academic pursuit that is very different from polling. Um, not that polling is, is uh, important or unuseful it's just this is a different because it's really polling gives you a snapshot in time kind of what people are thinking about a, an issue framed a particular way at a particular moment 
framing science lets us learn how people are thinking about the issue. And because we're able to find out sort of how they think about it, what their default thinking is about it, sort of where they go naturally when you raise certain words or show them certain images, it allows us to find a new way to present an issue and give people a different way to think about the causal dynamics at work. Um, it lets us lead rather than just follow. Polling basically lets us follow people where they already are. Um, framing lets us lead people kind of in a new direction. Mm. And it allows us to avoid some of the traps and problematic assumptions that we identify through the research that we didn't realize were getting in our way. So just this is um, a way to think about it. If we, if the four of us went outside uh, in the, somebody's backyard and looked up at the sky and saw a bunch of stars, we might all focus on different parts of the sky. But if somebody said, you know, look how those stars make up a Big Dipper, and then we all looked at those stars together and saw the Big Dipper, we'd be seeing the same thing. So framing science allows us to take a lot of information and connect the stars to see the same picture, kind of connect the dots. An important thing about framing science is that, um, you know, we're not trying to change people's minds with it. We're learning what the, something they already think and believe and using that um, commonly held belief as a way to start a new conversation. Because typically that broadly held belief that we identify is not the first way that think about people think about an issue, but it can be if we start working with them. But right now, well, the research identified what, how do people think about arts and culture when we use those words today. And the first thing we learned is, this is very interesting, they don't know what we're talking about. And it's kind of important. Uh, <laughs> in the focus groups. So these people came in for the focus groups. Uh, the facilitator was talking to them about the region as kind of an outsider to the region. And when she raised the issue of the arts, you could literally see people sit back in their chair and kind of get quiet because they were trying to figure out what the topic was. Once they sort of figure it out, this is what they think about. And they think about the arts as entertainment, as kind of one of those things that on a long list of things they might do with their time and money this weekend or the next time they have some free time. Which, as I said before, arts as entertainment is terrific um, if you want people thinking as consumers when you're trying to get them to buy tickets to your event. But that means it's really a private choice and not a public concern. And you can see why it would seem illogical to people that we would spend public funding on something that is really a private choice. Um, they also tend to have kind of a market view of the way that the arts work. So um, they think of good shows or good events as things that will be good enough that people will buy tickets, enough tickets to support them. And, you know, in the nonprofit arts, um, symphonies, chamber music, et cetera, we know that ticket sales only supports a, a portion of the actual costs of presenting that art form. So a couple other barriers we identified. Um, once people know what the topic is, and we might say in a big category of arts, you have you know, symphony music, uh, classical music, ballet, opera, museums, then people think about that topic. And for them, that equals something that they may or may not call it high art, but that's what they're thinking about. And they think of that as something other people do. That's the way most people think about the high arts or the fine arts. So people like this, right? Old people or people dressed up. The other thing they tend to think about is that um, when they think about those art forms, they think about iconic buildings, typically buildings in um, a downtown location and in the urban areas that for people is a place they don't like to go. We don't know why um, exactly they don't like to go there. We weren't testing for that, but there could be a number of reasons, hassle factor, fear, et cetera. Um, so those are two barriers that are tripping us up. Um, kind of the, the art forms they're thinking about, the connections they're making when we use the word art. Um, the other couple of things that we learned were that there are sort of two big value propositions that people have been using to think about the arts, talk about the arts in the public arena, arts education and economic impact. So we were testing to find out how people are responding to those value propositions. And when it comes to arts education, um, we can talk more about this if you guys want. Basically, this is the problem. And again, we observed this. We just watched it happen in the focus groups. And once you 
know it, you'll start seeing it. People have a lot to say about arts education. They get very animated when we start talking about arts education. Why? They're actually not thinking about the arts. Um, and if they do, they think about it this way, kind of like broccoli. Um, you know, it's good to have in your curriculum because it's good for you. Uh, but they, they are really talking about education. They're not talking about the arts. And the problem with that is that when you try to get them then to return to the topic of the kind of the importance of the sector and why we should be supporting public funding for the sector, they, they won't go there because they thought we were talking about education and the way to solve those issues is with the Board of Education or maybe the state legislature um, and a set of other solutions they have that really don't have anything to do with the arts. The other value proposition that um, advocates have used is economic impact, right? We've all done these um, economic impact studies. We've got national studies now. Um, let me preface this by saying I do think those studies are important and they can tell us a lot about um, the success that we're having uh, locally. And there are certainly some um, policymakers who really want this information and we should have it to share with them. Um, but what we learned in our research is that people don't, um, people basically don't believe us. So when we talk about a dollar in to the arts and seven dollars out in economic impact, they may nod their heads, but what they walk away thinking about is, um, kind of that's cool, but what about um, the impact of sports or what about the impact of the medical field or, you know, whatever it is that is the current topic in their region, the arts are considered just basically for most people, a sort of, um, nice, but not necessary luxury. And therefore, um, you know, not something that is going to be the, the most effective when it comes to economic impact. And I should say, I think that people are also getting increasingly skeptical about all of these economic impact studies. And we've seen that in some of our research as well. Um, so that investment that we've all made in economic impact studies is important, but it's not persuasive. So we learned some good stuff. One thing is that unlike some other issue areas where Topo has done research where like, I don't know, death penalty or um, gun control or something like that. There's no active opposition. Um, people use the arts as an example of things, you know, that maybe aren't a priority in public funding, but nobody hates the arts. And you heard Romney say that. I like the arts, right? He said that all the time. People have generally positive associations. They think the arts are nice. This made us happy. Uh, so what's the problem? As I said, the arts are nice, but people think of the arts as not necessary. So we were looking for a way to talk about the issue that offers a new perspective that makes people think about the arts as a matter of broad and public interest. Obviously, we need to tell them what we're talking about since they don't know automatically. Um, we want people to think collectively about the arts and we need the language for them to do that. Basically, we want people thinking as citizens and not consumers. So the idea that we learned worked is this one, and this is a shorthand, um, and there's more, much more to it, but basically it is a thriving arts sector creates surprising ripple effects of benefits throughout our community. This is a concept, first of all, people understand without explanation, they already agree with it and believe it, and they like the arts for the ripple effect of benefits that it makes in their community. What are the specific ripple effects? There are two of them that we identified. There might be more, but we know these two in particular work. One is something we call neighborhood or community vibrancy, and that's how the arts can change places um, when, say, a new theater opens up or a new dance school opens up or a new gallery or you have some new interesting street art. All of those things are pe things that people really like, and they can tell you their own story about how the arts have changed a place that they know. The other thing that people really value and the other benefit that has a ripple effect in communities is the way that the arts bring people together. And this was something really surprising. We heard it happen in the focus groups, um, but people really have kind of a, a sense that their neighborhoods, their workplaces are changing demographically. They're starting to see more people who come from different places, who look different from them, who have a different experience and background. And they see the arts as a way to connect, to, to get to know people better. Um, and they see the arts as doing that in, in a different way from other things that bring people into the same space. 
um, say like a softball game or something, because the arts are about ideas and that's what really allows people to get to know each other better. So this is a, a short paragraph. This is actually a tested paragraph and it, at, we don't ever have to use these exact words, but they help us understand why this works. The first sentence is why do leaders of cities around the country think of arts and culture as important priorities? And this, um, this is important because you can trigger people's thinking about an issue by the messenger and leaders of cities are believable and credible um, on, to on this topic to um, most people because they think of these as people as kind of, you know, authentic and, you know, they're, they're less political. They really care about their community. Why do they think that? Because when creative activity, notice we're not using the word arts again, creative activity is happening in large and small ways. Again, this is a way to help people think about not just those big iconic buildings downtown, but maybe what's happening in the arts in their public library or their community arts center. And it's throughout an area, not just downtown. It creates a surprising ripple effect of benefits. And this is key even for those who don't participate directly. In economic terms, theaters, museums, galleries, concerts, and so on mean more energy and life in a community, more tourists, more renovated buildings, more people and businesses moving to an appealing place. This is that neighborhood or community benefit that we talked about. And notice we've chosen some words to describe what we mean by the arts, so we don't have to use the word arts again. Again, here, a vibrant arts environment, and now we're describing it, music, dance, you can use any words you want um, to describe it, just as long as you do. Um, means more people coming together to share experiences and ideas, connecting with each other and understanding each other in new ways. And again, people can see why those kinds of connections can create a more supportive, trusting community, even if they're not the ones who went to a particular event. And this is just sort of the call to action. Uh, we actually thought the historic investment in the arts in the Cincinnati region, which is significant, um, would be a maybe a way to start the conversation, could even be a, a, a framing concept in itself. But what we learned is that people would say, yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. I know we have those great buildings and so on. But, you know, we don't sit around the piano after dinner anymore either. So that was then, this is now. So it didn't work as a leading concept, but it did work as a call to action. So here's how that changed the way we present things to the community. This is an old picture of how we would talk about the importance of communities supporting the theater. Um, this is kind of a new way. This is a community event with the citizens painting the street and our Cincinnati Ballet providing some street performances um, during the street painting. This is the way we used to talk about supporting the symphony. And this is a new image for the symphony. Um, I'm not going to show you that clip. I'm just going to tell you about it. Just basically, uh, I got a call. Actually, I got a tweet from a producer of a um, TV show on the morning of a free sampler weekend for the arts. And he was asking, where should we send our crew to get some good images of the free arts this weekend? So I uh, responded to him with a DM and said, um, you know, let's talk about what would be a good place. And we talked to his first question to me was, can you tell me the economic impact of what's going on this weekend? And um, I said, well, first of all, no, because it's happening right this minute. So I looked at that, but also we don't have any recent economic impact data. And I frankly don't think that your audience cares that much about the numbers, but they will care about seeing what's happening downtown as a result of this, um, all of this arts activity this weekend. So he sent out a crew um, let me see if I can get to a quick, good place in here just to show you. Um. Now, you probably recognize the town this weekend. You know it. Christina. Well, hey there, Curtis. If you were out and about downtown this weekend, you know it was booming as thousands participated in many free art events around the area. One of the biggest draws was right here at the Contem willing to spend a buck after but last night and the night before this entire area was bustling with vibrant people willing to spend a buck after seeing a free exhibit. 
They showed a lot of, you know, the reaction from the restaurants around our Contemporary Arts Center downtown, which had a big show of Shepherd Ferry as part of the free weekend. So sushi. We're growing. We're definitely growing. <laughs> and a lot of people are embracing us, especially downtown. When the arts and, uh, and business work together, everybody's happier. And that's Shepherd Ferry again. So that was really like two long five-minute um, uh, pieces on the five o'clock news and the eleven o'clock news that weekend, and that was that is exactly the kind of thing we were looking for. So we also work closely with people who have megaphones. So elected officials are great for that. And I got a phone call from our mayor's office shortly after we finished the research, saying, "Hey, the mayor wants to mention the arts in his state of the city speech, and do you have the economic impact data for us?" So I said, well, you know, we don't have recent economic impact data. And plus, we did this research basically for you. In other words, elected officials who support the arts and want to talk about them, they're the ones who are going to benefit the most from this, <clears throat> this research because it's, a, it's tested. We know that the public will agree with them about the importance of the arts as a matter for public funding and good public policy when they use this language. And so I, I shared the research with them, and this is what um, the mayor had to say at the State of the City. Let me tell you about another area where we see that kind of return on investments. That's in the arts. Cincinnati Arts, our music, our dance, our theater, our festivals, our museums, our galleries. They make this city vibrant. They bring people together. When the Aronoff has a show, downtown restaurants do much better than they normally do. When the Macy's Music Festival is in town, you cannot get a hotel room. And when the Playhouse in the Park has a play, you can't get in a restaurant in Mount Adams. I think that's just fine. When I walked into the event that night, his speechwriter said to me, Margie, this, this language is going to sound familiar to you. Well, of course it does. I mean, he basically took it straight out from our research, and then he gave his own examples, which was just awesome. Um, so that's the kind of thing that can happen when you share the research. I, I spent a good part of the afternoon. I thought I'd show you Rocco, and then, then I'll stop. Um, we had Rocco Landisman came to Cincinnati to help um, Artswave when it relaunched with a new name and new brand identity. And, um, you know, we knew from the work that he was doing with Our Town that this kind of language was going to really um, resonate with him. And, of course, I think what they were already doing at the National Network for the Arts, intuitively they knew that, that this language was going to work. Um, and they really appreciated the research because it kind of gave them the evidence they were looking for. But we, um, we worked hard to get Rocco to come for our relaunch. And um, I, I don't know all the reasons that he came, but we did find out that he, uh, his best friend from summer camp lives in Cincinnati. So he had been to Cincinnati many times, um, but he had never been through the neighborhood that we walked him through, which is a kind of burgeoning natural arts district with um, a couple of newer theaters and some schools that have moved into the area. Now we have galleries and restaurants popping up all over and it's, and new condos. It's really changing. It's not just because of the arts, but um, we wanted him to see it and then talk about it so that it would get repeated in the press um, in exactly that way. Um, and here's what he had to say at a public forum that afternoon. I, I spent a good part of the yeah, this afternoon over the Rhine. It's, it's, a, it's a term and a place that I've all the times I've been to Cincinnati a hundred times. I was never in this neighborhood. But the reason that I think it is because it was a neighborhood where there was mainly drug dealing, violent crime, abandoned uh, buildings. And now it's completely transformed. The arts have had a huge role in what you see. Uh, you see art galleries as you walk down the street and one of the visitors go to the theater. Uh, it really, this really is exhibit A in what we're going to be talking about in the next three years. How, how, the, how art, an artist can transform a place, make it a completely different place. It, it, it's, it's, it, the, the arts can revitalize neighborhoods. My boy, this is a great example. So that, that was exactly what we wanted to hear. And I later learned from his staff that he often used the example of the, that neighborhood in Cincinnati when he would go around the country talking about the importance of the arts. And what he, he's really been... Um, kind of openly um, saying is that I've, I want to find a way to talk about the, the value of the arts that is going to help when we go to, Ca to Capitol Hill and ask for more funding. And he's done a variety of things to help do that. And one of them is really to, to change some of the ways that we think about the role of arts in community. His chief of staff uh, sent me this clip 
um, after they visited Cincinnati. And he said, uh, and his, I hadn't seen this before, but he said in his note, um, state of Connecticut is, uh, was doubling funding, uh, and they're making this point, whoops, uh, instead of the money going out with no strings attached, we're placing the goal of creating a more vibrant community. And we want to put our money behind folks that are doing this well. So uh, the chief of staff, Jamie Bennett's point to me was, you know, you you know, you're it's working when you're starting to see increases in public funding when they're and they're using the language um, that you identified. And we've seen this in a number of other places now as well. It's, Connecticut was just one of the first examples that we had seen. So I guess the bottom line, um, you know, here for this research is the more we can um, have a kind of common voice um, about the way that we share the information about the role of arts and community, um, the more the public is going to start to see it that way. And that's how we build the kind of support that we're looking for, um, for things like the National Endowment for the Arts and, uh, and local funding as well. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. To me, the most interesting thing is... And we read articles and talk to people all the time who have a very sort of um, sanctimonious attitude about art, how if people just understood. So it's about taking the plebes and making them understand how important it is. I mean, I'm stating it very harshly, but your approach is so much more. And it's something I advocate for all the time. You're not going to change people's minds. You're going to use what they already believe as a way to get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> In and and what we've we've been trying to change people's minds with a lot of good information and we keep thinking oh if we just say this louder more often maybe get a story on the front page of the New York Times about the recent economic impact report will win but we've been doing that for a long time and it hasn't worked so yeah work with work with what people already agree with us on so Margie I think that's actually something that I found really interesting about your presentation is that um, the numbers don't seem to convince people all the time. And it seems like that to me when I'm thinking about disagreements that I've had with people in the past, not that that ever happens, but when I'm trying to convince someone of a position, the first thing that I think of is let's get some numbers. Let's find some, some data that that's because that's what I find convincing, I guess. Maybe other people find it less convincing, but it seems like there's a lot of data that point to this as well, because I, I mean, I remember reading five or seven years ago, uh, that book, um, Richard Florida, Rise of the Creative Class. Out here. Yes, Rise of the Creative Class. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and he talks about, you know, the coolness of a city and, and kind of defined by its creative community uh, being great for the economic, uh, the, the economy of that city as well. So um, I won't, I, I, it's interesting to me that those two things aren't together, that that, that, that connection isn't made by more people. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the... Uh, conception or the perception of the arts as an elite thing. And I'm wondering if there's anything in your research that might tell us how to uh, approach the, this kind of, this problem that we have of the arts as seen as, uh, as a special thing for special people rather than uh, something that is by and for normal people, for everybody. Um, well, I mean, I, this is a really interesting question to me and it's a terrific question. I do a lot of kind of, tracking and, and following along with organizations that are trying new things that I think will help um, the way that they're perceived in their community and whether or not that is as a kind of an elite thing that only certain people do when they go to a certain building and they're dressed a certain way um, and they have a certain amount of money or something like that. So um, I, to me, this is a question of, you know, how do we program? How do we market? Um, all of those things are, are really critical. And do we use new technology? So, you know, there's a great debate about tweet seats. Um, and I know there's concern and I don't know, we can't say yet whether they're even working, but when you have, when you offer tweet seats, you're saying something different about your presentation, your, the, the kind of performances and programming you do. And that's just one example. So it's interesting that you talk about the, the tweet seats. Um, we actually talked about a story last week from Mobile, Alabama. This uh, person wrote about their experience as a brand new symphony goer. Uh, they sat in the tweet seats 
and were tweeting about the experience hearing this violin concerto uh, live during the concert. And they actually said they engaged with the music more because they were thinking, they were listening closely and thinking about what to write on Twitter, which we thought was a a really interesting idea. And um, there's, there seems to be, there were some great photos in your presentation. And thank you again, by the way, for sharing that with us. I know it's a lot of work to put one of those things together and you'd, did even more work to condense it down for our show. So again, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, you had some really cool project photos in there. There was a photo of um, stuck out to me of dancers and street painters in this kind of s- street performance setting, which was really cool. And you had uh, a photo of a violinist, which seemed to be at a school kind of showing their instrument to a bunch of young people. And, it occurs to me that both of those are what I would consider to be outreach, arts outreach, which is kind of the buzzwordy, um, hip, trendy thing to talk about these days. And it seems like that kind of stuff is a fundamentally different thing than what we might call art for art's sake. We're going to talk about a piece later in the show uh, that's being presented at Issue Project Room right now by Sergei Cherepnin, composer. Um, called Music for One that is an individual in a room with the composer the whole time for 15 and you sign up for like a 15 minute slot and you do just that and it's just for you and it seems like when we talk about um, the the benefit of the arts to a community we're almost always talking about these outreach outreach that's a thing Uh, outreach things and we're not um really thinking about the more traditional is the wrong word because certainly this piece at issue project room is not traditional but the the art for art's sake stuff and i'm wondering if there's any kind of uh dissonance between those two things and what you do at topos i think we have to think about this in terms of goals right um are you guys familiar with the work of um clayton lord uh the um new beans book where um you might maybe you should have him on sometime. He's but kind of um, more of a you know the the personal individual reaction, and they're trying to figure out you know what is it about the experience of the arts that um, builds audience that that makes people come back, that makes people want to come back. And so Clay and I have talked about the difference between his work and our work as what you know there's there's one set of um, strategies that we might think about using that are designed to build audience, to to bring new audience or to engage existing audience and retain them. And then there's a set of um, things that we can do that are really designed to build broad public support whether or not people are going. And the work that we've just talked about is really designed specifically for thinking about how do we share the value of the arts in ways that will build that kind of broad support even though some of the people who are you know, seeing what we're doing are never going to be the ones who go, you know, into Symphony Hall. Um, and that's okay, right? So some of the activities that we organized and, and produced with the street painting, we also did a, um, a flash mob dance thing with, you know, 350 residents who came together to create that. We did, uh, you know, some surprise singing events, um, some bicycle arts events, those kinds of things that, I mean, some, some of those people participate a lot in the arts, others don't, and that's okay. But we're sharing a different way for people to think about the role of arts in community when we highlight events like that. I think there's a crossover here when um, when arts organizations themselves try to think about what we've learned from this research and how they can use that in the way they present themselves to the community. And that may in fact help them build audience, but they're really two separate goals. Well, Dave, I would say that um, if if you're achieving your goal of trying to get people to think more like citizens rather than consumers, then it's going to have a natural increase in in engagement with art for art's sake because the dancers that you met in that street dance are also going to be the people up there on their toes doing Swan Lake or whatever. And I think you, when you have a more personalized connection that feels like not these people who are elite doing this thing I don't understand, but these people in my community who happen to be ballet dancers, I'm going to go watch them, you know? 
I, I think that it can have a positive. Now, like she said, not everybody's going to go, but I think you could get new uh, audience that way pretty easily. It's interesting to me, too, that um, the effective programs you were highlighting uh, had to do with community, community based. Um, like local, you know, think local. And I worked in, a, in a, a liberal education environment a lot doing a fellowship while I was in school. And thinking about loca- local and community is, you know, is a big cornerstone of it. Um, I was wondering if you ever do uh, workshops or programs with um, like, uh, say, like a, a humanities departments or, you know, kids who are getting liberal arts degrees because um, a big thing that was was pushed on these kids and and rightfully so is you know you can get people who can talk about numbers all the time but you have to create a narrative if you want to convince people to fund your co-op or fund your ballet project or whatever so do you ever work with uh, education programs and how to have this kind of you know approach to policy yeah and i've i mean i've been asked i do a lot of um public speaking with this research and travel um i was just in san francisco last week meeting with a bunch of um, theater presenting organizations, but I've also done um, the work in classroom. Uh, So with some arts admin students, um, trying to think, I don't know that I've ever been asked to do just kind of with a sort of the basic liberal arts students, but usually people who are thinking that they're going to spend their career doing some kind of arts management. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I think it would be a perfect fit because, I mean, the students are, they're told constantly art is important. Art is important. And in a way, the message doesn't get any more complex than the message you were talking about that is ineffective. (laughs) So, I mean, I think they need to just, and it's so simple. All you're saying is use these words and not those words in a a big way, you know, and it's, it's almost like politics, you know, just controlling the message. And that reminds me of another thing I wanted to ask. Uh, my music educator friends would uh, strike me off their Christmas card lists if I didn't ask any questions about music education uh, and its role in in this outreach scheme. Um, it seems to me that if we're not getting kids that are engaged in and interested in the arts by the time at the latest that they're in junior high, we've already lost them. And I'm wondering... Uh, if your research maybe leads you to um, ways that that we can bring in uh, people who have grown up and are you know productive members of society but not involved at all in the arts how do we how do we bring in these people that maybe didn't have a great uh, arts education? background in in when they were in school is is there any is there anything that that in your research that leads us to solving that problem how do we go after joe (laughs) six-pack um well you know we i think we have um we have a fair amount of research that shows you know people who make those connections early are going to be our supporters in the long run right so what you're asking is whether we have evidence of it's not the, the reverse exactly but what happens if you're not I don't, I don't know that we know the answer to that question um, exactly, but um, it would be an interesting question to try to answer. Uh, I think, though, that it's, um, you might say, your frame is getting in the way here because people are exposed to art all the time. And, you know, they may not be getting it in art class or music class in elementary school. But I think one of the things we have to do is remind them that art is all around us all the time. So, for example, one of the things we did at ArtsWave, we created an app um, that was called um, I Spy Art. Um, and so it was a, you know, an iPhone and Android app. And it was a game, basically. It, it asked people to, um, every month we commissioned a new show, so to speak. Um, we, we gave it a theme, and we asked people to take pictures of what they saw that that was consistent with the theme, and post it on uh, in our gallery, our online gallery. Um, and the point of that really was to remind people that art is around us all the time, and it's everywhere. And so, yes, yes, it's I mean, it's not great that we don't have more arts education schools, and we do know something about how to build support for arts education, which is different from building support for the sector. It's a whole separate piece of research. Um, but absent that, I think then the, the real trick is for us to remind people that, you know, the arts do have an impact on all of us every day. 
Um, I was wondering if you have, and certainly your presentation that we that we didn't get to see all of us is a lot bigger than we saw. Um, I was wondering if you have a branch of your research that directly addresses effective ways to use, and I hate to use the term social media, modern communication technologies, let's say, effectively as a way to, you know, accomplish the goals we've been talking about. Um. I don't know that we had specifically, if you, if I was able to show you my whole presentation, I would share with you a lot of the different ways that we use the research in our day-to-day work. And so Mm -hmm. things like changing our name, um, which, you know, as I said, our name was fine arts fund and Mm -hmm. arts wave. Um, We changed the brand image. We changed everything about our website and the way we presented images and video to the community about what we do. We change the videos that we use as part of our annual fundraising campaign. We started using Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr. Really trying to reach um, a different group of people in a new way. Um, And I think all, I mean, ArtsWave's not alone in this. Everyone's experimenting with how to make that work. Um, And we're still, we're all still learning. I always say it's kind of the wild, wild west. (laughs) <laughs> it it really is and you know there's still room just the way there was there to go out and stake your claim and get rich all of the sudden unexpectedly um well the reason i brought that up is because our first story um and is sort of it's about my hometown but that's not why i put it in there but i was wondering if you had some yeah I was wondering if you'd have some thoughts about that because we're talking about programs that focus on local community but of course, what that really means is changing with um, social media and the amount of connectivity people are able to have. Um, and and to me, the kind of connectivity that's in this story, it's a, sto- a story about a, a live music performance in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is my hometown, that happened between Los Angeles and Chattanooga. And it's a real-time music collaboration, and it takes some, some hardcore equipment to make this happen in a way that has enough, you know, yeah, play music together. And it takes a lot, a a very low level of latency, which means a lot of expensive gear to make this happen. Um, But it creates that like real time connectivity that can happen, you know, across such a huge distance really redefines, especially in terms of collaborating musically, what it means to be reaching out to your local community. Um, so it just seems it's interesting to me that, um, you know, it's, I say all the time, you can't talk about art and spreading art and the importance of art and people sharing art without talking about the ways that they're sharing it. And the ability to share it in real time, coast to coast, is a big change. So what Sam is talking about is two people in different parts of the United States performing a duet, essentially play, playing live music together, uh, one of them in Chattanooga, Tennessee, one of them in Los Angeles, California, and there's a great video of this. Um, and you can see in this video, there's a guy that's standing, uh, there's a video screen at the back of the stage. The guy on the left side of the screen is standing there in Chattanooga. He's also, you see him below this the the screen standing in front of it. And then the guy on the right side of this screen is in Los Angeles and they're playing guitars and singing together. Uh, and it's an interesting thing and it's only possible because Chattanooga has uh, municipal fiber optic cable. The gay night life has lured you. Oh yeah. And I wanted to tell you. Liquor flow. Where you wait. So you heard a couple of spots in there where they're not singing quite exactly together. Uh, and Sam pointed this out earlier, actually, that that's probably at least as likely due to the to the fact that these guys don't sing together all the time and they probably didn't rehearse a lot um, as it is to the technology. And we should also say that this technology is possible because of this amazing uh, investment that the city of Chattanooga made in laying fiber optic cable and lighting it up and serving their community. It was it was finished with $111 million in stimulus money. It's interesting. That doesn't even sound like very, that doesn't sound like very much to me. I know. 
Well, the reason I think this is an important story is that, to me, linking if, – if you're talking – trying to get people's uh, public opinion to shift about the arts, to me, this kind of connectivity is very connected to the arts. So this kind of connectivity having in the city is a very important aspect in having a vibrant art, arts community to me as well. Because at $111 million a city, that's not that big of an investment, really, for the federal government, you know. If they want to take, you know, a bunch of major city centers and wire them up with fiber, and then you can have live gigs between Chicago and Louisiana and whatever. Anyway. And if you'll permit me another Richard Florida reference in the same show, um, one of the things that he does in his book, Rise of the Creative Class, is he broadens what maybe we as arts professionals think of as the the creative class to include people that are working on creative startups entrepreneurs and such and uh and a bunch of other things as well actually but I, it's interesting to me that chattanooga having this fiber optic cable is uh going to be this this really cool place for tech startups now. And the same, we see the same thing happening in Kansas city where Google is lighting up this gigabit ethernet, uh, in, in Kansas city, there are all these tech startups that are going to those places. And it's the, the, right. the creativity yeah, absolutely. that's a part of that is, uh, not in, not completely divorced from the creativity that we're looking for in arts advocacy. Um, so it's interesting. I think these things are, uh, related. Um, so let's get some more, let's get some more ethernet, some more ethernet, some more gigabit fiber in the world, guys. Get on this cities. Margie, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I think it's, it is a good example of a new, a way to reach a different audience um, and to, and to show the arts as so, sort of different from what people might naturally be thinking. Um, so depending on how you market it and then share it, like with this YouTube video, um, it really can be a new way of getting people to think differently about what what are the arts and how do they change my community. Yeah, well, it's if you watch the whole video, the first half is all talking, and it's basically a big Chattanooga is awesome commercial. Right. So they're using it as a way to try and get creative people there by saying, look what we've got. <laughs> uh, Dave, I've decided I want to go see a symphony concert in Detroit, and you know how I'm going to get there? My bicycle, I want to ride my bike. I want to ride my bicycle. Thanks, Sam. Now we're definitely going to get this episode taken down off of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, was a bicycle race by Queen. That's right. right. So the Detroit Symphony had its best selling concert in the history of the orchestra. By doing the music of Queen, uh, what is it, two weeks ago or something like that? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure everybody has an opinion about that. So I'm kind of of two minds about this. Part, part of me wants to say, uh, you know, wouldn't it be better if instead of getting all those people together and playing Queen... Uh, at them at the orchestra and getting this awesome Queen cover band known as the Detroit Symphony to, to play for these people. Wouldn't it be better if we got them all together and we played Elliot Carter's Variations for Orchestra? I just saw it last night in Miami with the New World Symphony. And uh, the other part of me wants to call the first part of me a snob and say, you, you know, you're a horrible person. This is music that they like. And it's not necessarily bad music but it's also you know music that they could get in a lot of other ways and are you really contributing something to queen or are you really just you know trying to make a quick buck and fund those carter performances well maybe a little bit but you know as as we talked about orchestras are, are not profit generating organizations they exist by subsidy and if they can figure out a way to eat into that subsidy by selling lots of tickets, I don't think there's anything – I personally am not any more offended by a Queen concert than I would be by like an all-Mozart concert. I would, I would rather go see the Queen concert. 
So Margie, I wonder if this is something that you deal with uh, from time to time with the, the, the research that you're doing and the projects that you're working on with Topos. Well, I'm going to go back to what I said before. I think it depends, you know, what, like, what's your goal is always an important question. And uh, doing something like what the Detroit Symphony just did, or let me give you an example from Cincinnati, which is a little different. They, two weekends ago, I think, no, just last weekend. Sometime in the last month, they <laughs> they played Beethoven's Ninth. It, they they called this weekend one city. Actually, it was more than a week, a month's worth. Of, called one city, one symphony. They had um, a series of community-based conversations, listening to. I didn't actually go to one, so I'm not sure if they did the whole thing or just portions of the symphony. And they had um, various people come and participate with the community conversations. These were free events in places like coffee houses and libraries. And then they um, sold, you know, some relatively inexpensive tickets to the um, to the symphony that weekend. And they simulcast um, in a couple of locations for free. Um, so anybody who wanted to could go see it live in one of these simulcast uh, places. Um, so. Doing things like that to me does a couple of things. One, it may bring you a new audience. And so that's, you know, if that's your goal, that may work. And whether those people come back and again to hear something that's more tradi traditional or presented more traditionally is something we'd have to monitor and would want to watch. But it also changes the way people in your community think about what you do. And it can, can get new people to look at you with new eyes, even if they don't go. And that also is important. Dave, I think I understand one of the, the roots of our problem now. Having Margie on the show, she's so practical about everything. And we have composers and performers on all the time, and they're so impractical. I'm starting to realize what the problem is. We're a bunch of idiots. That's why art's not more popular. You guys should know one thing about me I didn't reveal in my um, – uh, it's not in my bio. My parents are symphony musicians. Well, that pretty much explains everything, doesn't it? Uh, I grew up as a symphony brat, as so to speak. But my my dad was principal clarinet in the Cincinnati Symphony, and my mom was second violin. Um, what is your dad's name? Waller. My wife probably. My wife has a doctorate in clarinet performance, and I'm a pretty big clarinet geek for a non-clarinet major. So he retired a while ago, and he um, he's ran a chamber music series um, here in Cincinnati and um, and also did he worked a lot with the Aspen Music Festival. My mom became personnel manager of the orchestra and stopped playing and then she's she now lives in California and she runs a chamber music series as well. So, you know, a lot of these things are things that I've thought about and talked about my whole life, even before I really made the kind of applied the communications research to the arts, which had been a long time dream um, come true. So um, you know, I, I do think about these things a lot. I care about them a lot. And um, I, I appreciate artists as well, but I want to succeed. <laughs> I like it. Speaking of people succeeding, check that segue. Uh, we found out this week from the University of Louisville. Notice how I say Louisville like I'm from Kentucky, even though I'm not. Uh, we found out this week from the University of Louisville that uh, the winner of this year's Grammar Award and recipient of the $100,000 prize is a composer named Michel van der Aa. And uh, I don't know if you guys saw this. I knew coming into this week, as soon as I read this news, that I was going to have to say the name Michel van der Aa on Sound Notion on Sunday. And so I immediately tweeted, uh, hey, guys. If you were going to say this guy's name, how would you say it? And the of all people to set me straight was Michelle Vanderaa. So if you should definitely find Vanderaa Net on Twitter, um, that's his his Twitter handle. It was great. We should get him on the show sometime actually to talk about this. But he was he was really great. Uh, uh, anyway, his piece is called Up Close. It is uh, a cello concerto that has some really interesting multimedia stuff. There's a, a video that's pre-recorded. There's also um, an actor that's on stage, and there's kind of this movement stuff for the cellist as well. And it's it's actually recorded, and there's a great video of it. The trailer is up uh, on his site, and you can also buy both a DVD or um, 
a uh, download video, high definition or standard definition of this thing. So uh, I haven't had a chance to watch the whole uh, video. I did, I did get a copy of it and I watched the first few minutes of it. Um, but we're going to play just a little bit of this trailer. It's very cool. You're going to, I think you're going to dig it. So that was a little bit of the trailer for Up Close by Michelle van der Rohe, Grahmeyer award-winning piece this year. Um, something that became an interesting discussion this week on New Music Box, Franco Terry and Rob Diemer kind of almost had this classical newspaper point-counterpoint thing going on uh, about how awards are seen in the public and how they are judged. And uh, an interesting thing about the Grahmeyer, first of all, Despite the fact that it's a very big money prize, as I said earlier, $100,000, uh, which is much more than the, the Pulitzer Prize, it doesn't get as much ink, in part because the Pulitzer Prize is awarded not just to musicians, but to the people who make the ink. The people write the newspapers, get Pulitzers, and that's a big deal to them, so they see a music Pulitzer and they think, oh, that's a big deal, we should write about that too. The Grahmeyer does not get as much attention. Um, and one of the things that, that Franco Terry pointed out and was wondering if, if this was uh, maybe the best way to run such a competition, and he and Rob kind of went back and forth on this, was uh, the, the Pulitzer Committee is interesting because it, there is a round that is made up of composers, but there is also a round that includes some of the people that decide, I, I believe, that decide the Pulitzers for writing, for, you know, literature and journalism um and in fact the university of louisville has a system in the grommeyer judging process that has a few rounds there's a round that is uh, looked at by composers and music experts so to speak and there is also a round of uh kind of more general scholars but there's also a round of lay people of regular folk um and it, it reminded me of a discussion that we i don't we may have had this discussion on the show before uh about grand rapids art prize which also gets a lot of press because it's a big money prize you get a quarter million dollars for winning art prize which is just a general fine arts prize mostly visual arts in grand rapids michigan which is where we all at one point lived um nate lives there now I lived there for about a year in specifically Grand Rapids. Um, and that award is determined, the, the Art Prize Award is determined entirely by community vote. It, there's a, like a you text message, the special number that each um, uh, piece has. So, and there's a lot of debate over whether that really is awarding the most valuable art the best art at, at the competition because the things that win are the things that are the biggest most attention grabbing things and there are a lot of a lot of great pieces that are more subtle um or something like that that simply get ignored because 
they're they're not valued by uh the general public the general public is looking for something big all, all the finalists every year seem to be enormous pieces huge works um so it, it's an interesting discussion i don't know what do you guys think about uh the art prize or the grandmeyer that to me sounds like a really interesting model i mean having it i mean having the public involved in a way i think is i think is good just getting a lot of opinions in there and then ha- but having that with experts and with different scholars i think it seems like a good combination to me well, I kind of have I'm I have mixed feelings about it in general. While I'm certainly supporting any composer having a windfall so that they can spend a lot of time composing, right. I also think, you know, $100,000, what else could we do with $100,000 besides decide this one piece by this one guy is worth that much money? You know? I mean, what's the what is the real purpose um by having this kind of award? Well, you want to support the art the arts, but is that how effective, you know, in a brass tax way is that in supporting the arts? And is, is there an aspect of it that is just wanting to raise the sort of profile of your contest as the, you know, scorekeeper of record for who wrote the best piece that year? And, and the, you know, the, whatever the, the, uh, the status within the artistic community that comes with it, I guess. Well, if I may one last time return to our discussion of goals, um, you know, what is the purpose? What is the goal of one of these competitions? And I don't think that it is necessarily to say that this is the piece. Um, you know, we I talk all the time. Somebody asks you what your favorite piece is or your favorite composer is. That's kind of a silly, almost juvenile question because there are a lot of great pieces. There are a lot of great composers and there are a lot of pieces that are worthy of recognition uh every year and you know the 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 Grommeyer goes to a piece and the Pulitzer goes to a piece and they're different pieces I don't know if they've ever been the same I doubt it um but I don't think that it's saying that this is the singular best piece I'm just I think that it says that this is a great piece it's worthy of all the recognition we as the committee awarding such things can give it. Um, so I, I think that's a different thing. And that's, um, I think what you're, 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 the the idea that it's saying that this is the best is kind of a, it's, it's a false choice. Well, I don't, I I'm, I'm talking I about say. what they, how they're, how I suspect they're perceived by the public if they're perceived by the public at all. Like if if this award starts getting, they talk about how this award doesn't have the notoriety of the Pulitzer, even though they're giving away that much money. Um, if it did have the notoriety, how would that notoriety be fed? Would it be because people think, well, this is the scorekeeping mechanism and this is the best? I think there's going to be a, an aspect of that in place. Um, yeah, I think I think you're no matter think, what they claim they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think you're probably right, um, but. I feel like it's especially since we have so many different awards. That's, I I mean, I don't feel like that anybody. I don't know. I certainly don't think that. Do you think that's what what people are understanding? I think that's an aspect of it. I think that like people perceive the Pulitzer Prize that way, you know. And if this gets had the notoriety of the Pulitzer House, would they perceive it? Well, I don't know, but I feel like. This is, and, and you, you kind of questioned the size of the award, and I think that the size of the award is part of what gets it in the newspaper, and uh, I think that's valuable. No? What do, you, what do you think, Margie, about return on investment for giving $100,000 in, in, in like this, in this situation? <laughs> I actually, I think I agree... Um, Nate's our, our first comment about I like the combination of experts and real people, um, and I think there can be value in that depending on what your goal is. But if part of your goal is you know to change to open, you know kind of open the window to some people, that might be a way to do it. Um, I do think that the Grand Rapids Art Prize has, I mean, they've been masters at getting international mm-hmm. attention to their community, um, and you know, maybe maybe this prize to focus on how to do that too for the performance or for the process or both. Um, so I, I don't 
I, I have seen proposals where it's um, awarding a prize just based on what the, the people say. And I think that's sort of, you know, it's helpful to have both, you know, the professionals and the people participate. All right. Well, um, Sam, what do you think about cutting this, uh, the body electric story? We're going pretty long. Oh, come on. It's so long already, and it's an interesting story. Well, you got, you got 30 seconds. Really fast. This mm. guy, who is the artist in residence, or I don't know if they have more, he's one of the composers in residence at the Issue Project Room in Brooklyn, uh, wrote, composed a piece that is performed on your body by laying on a blanket and also attaching a few choice electrodes to you, and then he sends... Uh, a controlled set of frequencies through your body creating biophysical uh, uh, reactions that are the piece. Um, it's, and it's, it's interesting to, to hear about. So uh, there's not a lot more to say about it other than, man, oh, man, I would love to go and have that done to me. <laughs> and we need to get that guy on the show. And then I think Nate has the know-how that we could have the guy get Nate to set it up, and we, we could do it to Nate over over Skype. <laughs> there you go. Sure. That we'll just got a little face. bit more ridiculous than I would I, have expected. I, I could use a little, like, activity a little on my Sunday afternoon. A blanket noise uh, <laughs> stimulation stuff, whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's an interesting story, and uh, just for the record, the Issue Project Room is the coolest indie club name of all time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to close out the show this week our pick of the week the Sam's pick of the week is of course uh, Michelle van der Oz Up Close the cello concerto with multimedia um, we kind of ran ourselves out of a lot of time to talk about it but it's a it's a very cool thing you, you, you saw a little bit in the trailer that we played earlier that um, there's this interesting interaction between uh, an actor and a video of that same actor on stage. And then of course the cellist is doing, uh, I guess dance wouldn't be exactly the right word, but there's, there's movement that the cellist is doing that goes along with the whole thing, standing up, sitting down and, and, and uh, there's images that, that suggest interaction between the screen and the live action. And it goes both directions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like it suggests screen person sort of entering live person's world and vice versa. Um, so, and it's really, it just looks really, really interesting to me. I can't wait to see the whole thing. So you really ought to at least watch the trailer that we'll link to in our show notes. Uh, and then if you like the trailer, you can, you can buy a DVD of the work or you can buy a video download of the work in, uh, standard definition or high definition. Um, so I would highly encourage anyone to do either of those things. Uh, and I think we're going to wrap the show margie thank you so much for joining us and sorry we, we we blabbed on for so long after you um but it was really great having your uh viewpoints on some of those stories that we had in addition to the, the great presentation you put together so thank you so much for joining us the interest i appreciate it uh do, do you have any, any is there any big stuff that we should be looking for from topos coming up um, you know, I'm going to uh, share with you guys the link to the research report on our website. And you, on that page, you will also see The World, you like this, the world's first uh, game-sourced short film, which uh, a oh. local digital firm uh, created based on the research. So I think it's also the first short film ever based on some framing science research. But it's really fun. It's got a superhero, and it's all about how the arts can change places. So I'll send you the links to those things. Very, very cool. cool. We'll look forward to that for sure. Um, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. It's been a long one, but I think it's been a, a really good one. Um, to read more about any of these stories that we talked about, to get links to all of Margie's stuff, uh, including the things she just talked about and her group's research, uh, you can find all that stuff on our site, soundnotion.tv. And thank you to everyone who joined us live in the chat room. Um, if you would like to join us, we're here every Sunday at 11 a.m., soundnotion.tv slash live, and you can join us in chat and share your thoughts on all the crazy things that we're talking about and tell us how stupid the body electric thing is with electrodes or how awesome <laughs> the body electric thing is with the electrodes uh, or 
uh, you know, any, any of the things that we've talked about uh, in chat there, or you can catch us afterwards again, soundnotion.tv slash SN. We're also all on Twitter. Um, I'm at Dave McDow. Nate is at a Nate tree. Sam is at house Goy, and you can find Margie at Margie art girl with two R's and girl and no I, and also team <laughs> team topos. Um, so, uh, you should definitely connect with us on Twitter. We're also on Facebook and so, so topos. Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store. So be sure to go there, subscribe for free and catch every single episode. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you back next week. Girl. <laughs>